Welcome to the 11th recording of our natural disasters course, sorry, our 11th lecture. In this lecture, we'll be discussing climate change. <clears throat> so to understand the climate change that's currently occurring on Earth, we have to understand what factors influence the climate on Earth going back to the early moments of the planet and the, the nature of Earth's atmosphere and atmospheres of other planets as well. So looking at the inner planets and our atmospheric compositions, Venus uh, being the second closest planet to the sun receives intense solar radiation, which is trapped by extremely dense CO2 rich atmosphere. And uh, the combination of the intense solar radiation and the large amounts of CO2 results in extremely high surface temperatures of around 477 degrees center, centigrade. So over four times the boiling point of water at atmospheric pressure. On Mars, it receives less solar energy, uh, but it has a very thin atmosphere that is rich in CO2. So it holds the heat effectively. So its surface temperature is around negative 53 degrees centigrade. So Venus and Mars' atmospheres, <clears throat> they've changed very little in the last 4 billion years. However, that's not the case for Earth. Earth's atmosphere has experienced radical change from a very CO2 rich atmosphere in early parts of it to a CO2 poor atmosphere currently. So here is the atmosphere of the inner planets, uh, Venus, early Earth, Mars, and then Earth today. This is the amount of uh, the first row is amount of CO2, nitrogen, oxygen, and argon, then their average temperature and pressure. So Venus, has a very large amount of CO2, like early Earth. In fact, CO2 is the dominant gas, and there was a lot of it. You could see that the Venus is very hot. It's close to the sun, so it was early Earth. It's not as close, it wasn't as warm. And the pressure, um, which is indicates how large the atmosphere is, how, how much atmosphere, um, there was 60 times, 60 times as dense then as it is now compared to the pressure Earth's atmosphere today. Mars has a lot of CO2 as well. However, Earth today has very little CO2, a lot of nitrogen, a lot of oxygen. You see, there's only trace amounts of oxygen in the early Earth's atmosphere. So there's been this flip right in Earth's atmosphere, this transition from a CO2 rich, oxygen poor, and nitrogen poor to a nitrogen and oxygen rich and CO2 poor atmosphere. And so you can see uh, this on the x-axis is time billions of years ago. So you're going backward in time this way. And this is the concentration of various gases in the atmosphere on the y-axis. So initially there was a lot of water vapor in Earth's atmosphere and carbon dioxide. And over time, both the water vapor and the carbon dioxide decreased. And eventually about two and a half billion years ago, the levels of oxygen really began to increase in the atmosphere of Earth. So what caused changes of in Earth's atmosphere? Well, largely life. So Earth's changes in Earth's atmosphere are caused by life. And life is something that Venus and Mars do not have. So photosynthetic life, like plants and photosynthetic uh, bacteria and algae, they remove CO2 from the air in the pro through a process called photosynthesis. And then there's also CO2 that dissolves into the ocean. And that is absorbed by marine organisms too to make shells. Um, and because the CO, the carbon and the oxygen is chemically tied, chemically tied up with calcium to make calcium carbonate, which is the material that shells are made out of. So seashells like clams, snails, oysters, and um, also coral build their exoskeletons, the reefs out of them. So that was, uh, so a lot of CO2 is absorbed by organisms to make shells out of as well, which that, that now those shells have been turned into limestone. So early photosynthesizing life on earth removed enough CO2 from the atmosphere for other animal life to begin to survive. So whenever they, into a photosynthesis, they absorb CO2 and they give off oxygen. And those oxygen, those that oxygen allowed for animals to evolve. And then those animals made exoskeletons out of calcium carbonate, which further reduced the amount of carbon dioxide, which 
reduced, lessened the greenhouse effect on Earth and, and, and led to the lowering of temperatures. So as carbon was removed, carbon dioxide was removed, people often refer to uh, carbon dioxide as just as carbon. Um, as carbon dioxide was removed from Earth's atmosphere, the greenhouse effect was lessened and the temperature decreased. Now, there are changes in Earth's atmosphere regarding the amount of carbon dioxide in it today, also due to light processes. It's, what in, uh, it's part of what's called the carbon cycle. So we have carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, and then carbon dioxide dissolves into the ocean, and it undissolves out of the ocean. So this is the amount that dissolves into the ocean, this is the amount that undissolves out of the ocean. Some of it gets buried. These are all in gigatons of carbon. Some of it gets uh, trapped and buried in ocean sediments. And um, organisms like plants and photosynthetic bacteria, they die and, they're buried, and their bodies are buried and they're made up of carbon, right? And that carbon came from the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. That's why we're called carbon-based life forms, right? And so plants today, they absorb carbon dioxide through photosynthesis from the atmosphere. And so that's our main two uh, sinks of carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is absorbed into the ocean. You see a large amount of it comes back out, but carbon dioxide is absorbed by plants through photosynthesis. Uh, whenever there's no sun, plants need to use their sugars that they made, so plants do respire. They do give off CO2 and consume oxygen um, whenever they have to use their sugar. Uh, if there's, they have to, they have to actually use their sugars to fuel their, fuel their growth. Um, then we have the release of carbon in organisms as they decay. And then we have fires, so wildfires uh, and man-made fires that whenever you burn organic matter, carbon dioxide is released. And then the burning of fossil fuels. So as we burn fossil fuels, that carbon that was um, used to make the bodies of the organisms, the structures of the vegetation, the bacteria, and the algae. Um, whenever we dig that up in the form of oil or, or coal, and we burn that, that carbon is re-released back into the atmosphere in the form of carbon dioxide. Okay. So before life, the atmosphere was full of CO2, and, um, and there was a very strong greenhouse effect. And the surface temperature is about 290 degrees centigrade. And so we discussed the greenhouse effect a little bit. We talked about external energy. The greenhouse effect uh, is whenever the incoming visible light is emitted as short wavelength light. The atmosphere then warms up because the surface absorbs the light, the surface warms, and that it gives off energy that forms up the atmosphere. And that heat is given off by the Earth's surface in the atmosphere in the form of infrared light or radiation, which is longer wavelength. That longer wavelength outgoing radiation is trapped by the greenhouse gases. The greenhouse gases absorb it and re-radiate it back down. And so this produces a greenhouse effect, such as uh, it got this name because glass does the same thing. In the greenhouse, um, you can also experience this effect in a car, right? Or, uh, or, a, or a room that has windows. That's uh, the, the light passes through the glass, it warms the surface, the surface radiates heat, that heat cannot escape through the glass. So the heat builds up inside, increasing the temperature. Right, so the gases in the atmosphere that act like the glass and trap the heat in are known as greenhouse gases. And they include carbon dioxide, water vapor, methane, and chlorofluoro chlorofluorocarbons, also known as CFCs. CO2 is the most important greenhouse gas, not because it's the strongest, but because it's the most abundant. So currently, there is 0.04% of CO2 in the atmosphere. So we have a weakened greenhouse effect compared to early Earth. The average temperature on Earth is 34 degrees centigrade higher than it would be without any CO2. So we, so we need CO2 in the atmosphere. We need the greenhouse effect to hold the heat to Earth's surface, to have liquid water and so forth. Earth has always been influenced by the greenhouse effect and life has always been in dynamic equilibrium, 
equilibrium with the greenhouse effect. However, humans are now changing the atmosphere concentration or by burning uh, concentration of CO2 by burning tremendous volumes of living plants, trees and shrubs, and dead plants in the forms of coal, oil, and natural gas. So relatively small amounts may be enough to trigger climate shifts, small amounts of CO2 that is. So looking at Earth's climate on very long time scales, time scales of millions of years, sedimentary rocks, they contain information about the climate in the past, whenever they formed. And so we can see there were warm climates in the past by uh, records of uh, fossil reefs, limestones, aluminum ore bauxite, which forms in tropical soils, and evaporate minerals. Those are all geologic markers of very warm climates. Cold climates are indicated by erosion by glaciers, which are distinctive marks and uh, debris depositions. Certain fossil organisms also can indicate paleo temperatures and we can drive the history of Earth's climate. So we can, we can see what Earth's climate was like, not only in the recent past, but in the deep past, millions on time scale, millions of years. So Earth's climate, it depends on the balance of, uh, between incoming and outgoing heat. And so the Earth at any given time may be gaining or losing heat overall. And that's how its climate warms or cools. Earth is divided into belts of frigid, temperate, and torrid by latitude. So the frigid is you know, the poles, the torrid is around the equator, and then temperate is in between. Ice ages are indicated by whenever the frigid zone expands to a larger area, and the torrid zone shrinks and is narrower, but doesn't quite disappear, where a torrid age, which is a very warm period, is whenever the torrid age expands, uh, range expands, takes up a larger area, but the frigid zone does not quite disappear. It's just smaller, more concentrated at the top. So we have an idea of, of what Earth's climate was like in the deep past. So, and we know that Earth's climate was much warmer than it is today, and is also much cooler than it is today. There's been a lot of variability in Earth's climate. Uh, looking at it more recently in times, uh, on a time scale of thousands of years, in the last 1 million years, there's been 10 periods of glacial advance, advances and retreats. So glacial advances are indicative of cooler periods in Earth's climate, okay, with extensive glaciation. And so in the last 9 million years, there's been 10 episodes of Earth's climate cooling and then warming. Glacial retreat is an indicative of warming. Cooling and warming, cooling and warming. All right, so this, this uh, oxygen 18 ratios, this is a, a proxy, which is a measurement used to uh, represent temperature of oxygen uh, isotope ratios that, uh, that uh, indicate the, uh, the, uh, the temperature and therefore the global ice volume. And you can see there is more ice when it's cooler and then it warms and there's less ice. It cools and there's more ice and warms and there's less ice cools more ice, warms less ice, cools warm. Uh, as it cools, there's more ice, and then it warms, there's less ice. So you can see this, this cycle in the cooling and the warming. And this is caused by cycles in Earth's orbit around the sun, which affects the amount of solar radiations received by Earth. These changes were first postulated in the 1920s by a Serbian astronomer, um, known by last name Milankovic, and uh, it's supported recently by Greenland, Greenland ice cores. So you drill down, they drill down through the ice and they can study little air bubbles in the, uh, in the ice and get more information about um, the composition of the climate and also actually composition of the atmosphere. But also the thickness of those layers of ice indicates how cold or warm of the different layers uh, the climate was in the past. So that's those ice cores confirm that. So Milankovitch defined changes in Earth's orbit, tilt, and wobble. And this, these changes in these, these parameters, these astronomical parameters, change the amount of solar radiation received by Earth. So this is the past. Okay, this is the eccentricity. The eccentricity is how circular the um, Earth's orbit is. Eccentricity of one is a circle. And as it gets 
um, larger than one, it's more of an ellipse. It's basically the ratio of the major and minor axis of a circle. And so you can see that uh, the higher the eccentricity, the more elliptical Earth's orbit is, and the lower the eccentricity, the less elliptical the Earth's orbit is. The tilt is the angle at which Earth's rotational axis is relative to the plane of the solar system. You can see the tilt oscillates back and forth. This is the wobble. This is like a, if you spin a top and you see a top, oh, the, top the, the top kind of wobbles, right? It's also known as precession. It's the Earth's rotational axis has a little bit of a wobble to it. This is the wobble. Um, Okay, and so you see here, this is the eccentricity, right? This is a very uh, eccentric orbit. This is a less eccentric, uh, more circular orbit. Obviously, the more eccentric the orbit, there's periods of time where it's further from the sun, so it, releases, it receives less solar radiation. So those are correspond to cooler climates. Right, and over it has le it's less eccentric. It's closer to the sun for more time, and so it receive more solar radiation. So it'd be warmer climates. The tilt fluctuates between 21 and a half to 24 and a half degrees off the vertical, and it oscillates between those on a 41,000 year cycle. And why that matters is the more tilt there is, the more direct radiation higher latitudes will get, and so less ice there will be. And the less ice there will be, usually the warmer the Earth is because there's less white surface to reflect energy, and so more energy is absorbed. And so the more vertical the tilt is, the less direct energy is received by near the poles, and so there's going to be more ice. So a larger tilt is warmer, a smaller tilt is cold. And the wobble also changes the amount of energy received at the high latitudes, just like the tilt does. So those three natural phenomenon cause change in Earth's climate just due to changes in Earth, its orbit, tilt, and wobble. So about two, uh, sorry, 20,000 years ago, glaciers were at a maximum extent and they covered 27% of today's land. So this is the last major ice age. Virtually all of Canada and parts of the Northeastern US were covered by glaciers. And the seawater that was necessary to build those glaciers uh, was no longer in the sea. It was locked as ice on these glaciers. And so sea levels were lowered by 130 meters from today's level. The current ice age continues, but it's just in a glacial retreat phase as we're coming out of the ice age and warming. 10% of the continents are still buried under ice. And if the, all the ice on Earth would melt, sea levels rise and there are 65 meters. And so here you can see this at the peak of the last ice age, this was the sheet of ice. It's called a Laurentide ice sheet that covered North America. This was the tundra, which is basically an area where it's cold enough that the land is always frozen. This is subarctic and this is temperate. And then this is subtropical. So this climate is basically the climate we have today. So Texas is Texas climate and Louisiana and the Carolinas, their climate would be like ours today, where where we are now, we would be the tundra, if not under ice. Actually, we would be under ice. And so this was the southern extent of the glacial ice. Right here, you can see we were actually under ice because right here it was the edge of the ice sheet. And this was the coastline. The red line is the coastline. Right? And uh, if all the ice would melt, this would be the coastline, the green line. And you see, that's a problem because there's a lot of people live between the modern day current coast and that green line. So, Following those, 20, you know, since the 20,000 years ago, the peak of the last ice age, warming has begun, but then it was interrupted by, so this is temperature on the y-axis and time on the x-axis. So it was a general warming, but then it was interrupted by this period known as the older dryas. Then the cold interval was replaced by a very warm period called the bowling period. Then the temperatures fell during the Elrod period. 
And then there was a, another cooled spell, the younger Dryas, about 12,900 uh, 12, to 11,600 years ago. And then it has been warming since. So temperature changes of three to five degrees occurred in several years, right, which is very, very rapid. So cause of sudden, these sudden jumps in temperature, drops or jumps in temperature. Well, there, as the ice sheets, uh, continental ice sheets melted, they left behind these large, huge, uh, cold lakes behind what are known as ice dams. And then whenever these ice dams fail, failed, they released enormous amounts of fresh water. Uh, and this cold, fresh water flowed into the surface and it disrupted the layering of the ocean, disrupted the circulation in the ocean, which is a major way in which heat is distributed throughout the earth. And uh, that disruption of ocean circulation has a large impact on the climate. Uh, and then there's a constant rise of and sea level due to the melting ice as well. At 7,000 years ago, there were warmer global temperatures, higher rainfall totals, and there was a cli recent climactic optimum. Since then, the average global temperature has fallen two degrees centigrade. So smaller cycles of glacial expansion and contraction have occurred within the last 7,000 years. So we've been last 7,000 years on that time scale, we have seen, have seen a cooling trend. There's been blips in the general trend um, due to volcanism. So large planetary eruptions, they blast the fine ash and gas into the stratosphere, which is above the troposphere where weather occurs. The ash and sulfuric acid from the, which forms from the sulfur, uh, sulfur dioxide that the volcanoes release they remain in the stratosphere as a haze for years, blocking incoming sunlight and resulting in a cooling in the climate. For example, El Chichon erupted in 1982. Uh, there was four big planetary eruptions, uh, smaller than the eruption of Mount St. Helen, but more than 100 times uh, sulfur, sulfur dioxide gas was remitted to the stratosphere. And this sulfur dioxide gas took 23 days to circle the globe, which generated some very colorful sunsets but it lowered the global average temperature by 0.2 degrees centigrade. Mount Pinatubo in 1981, this eruption pumped 20 million tons of sulfur dioxide into the stratosphere, which reflected two to 4% of the incoming solar radiation. So as a 20 to 30% decline in solar radiation is actually reaching the ground. And the average global temperature dropped by half a degree centigrade, which included a one degree drop in the US offsetting global warming actually for that year. Then further back, 1918, sorry, 1815, Mount Tambora eruption, large eruption, produced 175 cubic kilometers of ash and debris and made year 1816. It was the year without a summer. Because uh, global uh, average global temperatures were decreased by 0 0.3 degrees centigrade. It's also triggered a cholera epidemic and um, it combined with an 1809 mystery eruption, which we, we don't know which eruption it was, where it was, to make the 1810s an extremely cold decade. Then Mount Toba in Indonesia, even further back, around 74,000 years ago, which we mentioned this, erupted about 2,000 cubic kilometers of ash and debris. And that ash and sulfuric uh, acid cloud estimated to have lasted in the stratosphere up to six years caused global cooling, which was possibly as much as three to five centimeters, oh, sorry, centimeters, degrees centigrade, resulting in what's known as volcanic winter. And uh, it's thought to have almost drove early humans to extinction. So these Panayan eruptions, they can have an impact on the climate for a few years. And a resurgent caldera eruption like Yellowstone can have an impact for several years. So it's possible for several different volcanoes to erupt over uh, several successive years in a row, just by chance. And that could result in having a long-term effect on the climate and resulting in a little ice age. So uh, we have seen you know, potential evidence of this in Greenland ice cores. Uh, those ice cores show records of very high acid content during these periods of time. There was multiple volcanic eruptions 
within a relatively short period of time from each other, which uh, had a cooling effect on the Earth's climate. So the factors of a volcanism's effect on climate are the size and rate of eruptions, the height of the eruptive column, how high in the atmosphere the materials erupted, types of gases in the atmospheric level of placement, and how low or in, in the low latitude versus high latitude. And that, uh, so whether the, how close the volcano is to the equator or how far away it is, because that influences how weather patterns spread the debris. So the worst case scenario is, uh, which has happened, is the flood basalt eruptions, such as what had occurred in the Siberian traps 251 to 250 million years ago. And um, these large volcanic eruptions, we mentioned about this when we talked about volcanism, um, they pumped out so much carbon dioxide that they caused significant warming of the climate and thought to be cause of the Permian Triassic mass extinction, known as the Great Dying by paleontologists. So uh, this has caused over the course of one to four, uh, sorry, over the course of several, um, a couple million years, uh, there was one to two, sorry, one to four million cubic kilometers of basaltic lava erupted. And with it came large amounts of climate changing greenhouse gases. And uh, so such as CO2 and sulfur dioxide, and that caused a significant warming of the climate over the course of a couple million years and acidification of the ocean. This happened again 65 million years ago. This and uh, what's now in the Deccan flood uh, platform, what's now the Deccan Plateau, which is modern day India. And this aided in the extinction of the dinosaurs. Large amounts of basaltic lava erupted in only a span of half a million years. And so the increase in atmospheric CO2 could cause temperatures increased by 10 degrees centigrade. And it resulted in a more acidic ocean waters as the CO2 dissolves into the ocean and creates carbonic acid and it could have depleted the ozone layer. So those are the worst case scenarios as far as volcanism influencing our climate. So in the last thousand years, there's a com the combined effects of the eccentricity, tilt, and wobble have caused a cooling trend with, normal, with several variations. And uh, so the astronomical factors that influence our climate are, are resulting in a cooling of the climate, or they would normally result in a cooling of the climate. The variations are studied to learn more about the extent of temperature fluctuations, whether they're regional or simultaneous around the globe, and what are some causes of these changes. Other variations within this cooling trend are studied with oxygen isotopes in glacial ice layers, annual growth rings of corals, tree ring widths and densities, tax records of grain and grape crops, advances and retreats in mountain glaciers, paintings of frozen lakes and rivers and ports, and weekly per, uh, per year of weeks per year of sea ice around Iceland. So these are all other data used to, you know, study and, and record variations within this general cooling trend that's been happening for the last 7,000 years. So there was a, in the last, uh, more recently, last 2,000 years, there was a medieval maximum. Uh, so it was relatively warm. So remember, there's been a cooling trend for the last 7,000 uh, years. But there was a relatively warm period during the medieval uh, times, or 1,000 to 1,300 uh, CE. Then there was a little ice age, right? It's called little ice age because it was just a period of, of cooling between 14 and 1,900 CE. And then there were small scale Coolings and warmings within the Little Ice Age. You can see here the little small scale warmings and coolings of the Little Ice Age, such as the Maunder Minimum, which is a cooler period about 1645 to 1715. And, um, and there was also during this time minimal sunspot activity. So the sun was possibly a quarter percent weaker during that time. So there was less solar radiation. So the climate's Earth's climate is, you know, bouncing around. There's a general cooling climate, uh, trend the last 7,000 years, which was laid on top of a general warming trend the last 20,000 years as we've been coming out of the 
ice age. And so the changes in Earth's orbital pattern are causing cooling, lessened solar energy uh, production is causing cooling, and volcanism has also caused changes. And there's interactions between the ocean, atmosphere, and ice sheets that influence the climate as well. And so there it looks like there, you know, maybe a millennium cycle with uh, warm centuries followed by cold centuries. The 20th century may be, have been uh, the beginning of a warm century. So that might be what explains, you know, the, the warming from, you know, 1900 to year 2000. It could just be part of this cycle. The 20th century actually began as warm as any time in the past thousand years. So the year 1900 was as warm as any time in the past thousand years. Average global surface temperatures rose 0 0.6 degrees centigrade in the 20th century from uh, 1910, 1944, and since 1977. Uh, in 1910, 1944, the warming is thought due to uh, a hotter sun, a lack of volcanism. And warming since 1977 has been twice that that occurred between 1910 and 1944. And that accelerated warming is likely due to the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. And so of the 0 0.6 degrees centigrade warming over the century, natural causes can be accounted to for our to contribute 0 0.2 degrees centigrade. Right, changes in Earth's orbital uh, patterns, that's about 0 0.02 degrees centigrade. And um, hotter sun, which is more than 0 0.2 degrees centigrade, uh, centigrade increase. And the, so the remaining four, 0 0.4 degrees centigrade increase uh, is thought to be the result of human activities, production of more greenhouse gases. So the greenhouse effect has always acted to warm Earth's climate, as we know. The strength has varied over time. Um, the greenhouse gases are, are currently being added to the atmosphere by humans, which has not occurred before in the history of the Earth. And so here we have the list of greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, uh, ozone, and CFCs. This is a relative percent um, responsible for greenhouse warming. So carbon dioxide was responsible for 60% of the warming, then methane, and then CFCs, and then ozone and nitrous oxide. And this is the ability to trap heat compared to CO2, if CO2 is one. You see methane is 21 times more uh, powerful at trapping heat than CO2. Nitrous oxide is 310. Ozone is 2,000 times more powerful than CO2, and CFCs are 12,000 times more powerful than CO, CO2. So CFCs, those are um, uh, those are found in like refrigerants and in cooling systems. And so the federal, the U.S. government is actually phasing them out. So, so if you put in a new cooling system, you cannot use CFCs as a refrigerant anymore. Water vapor is also a significant uh, uh, greenhouse gas. It's uh, Earth's most abundant greenhouse gas. It is vast and there's a natural axis of natural control and temperature. The warmer the air, the greater the percentage of water vapor it can hold. The greater volume of water, uh, water vapor means the greater amount of trapped heat. So it creates this positive feedback cycle. So when did humans begin adding to the greenhouse warming? Well, the burning of oil, natural gas, and coal and wood currently releases huge amounts of CO2 in the atmosphere. Uh, 8,000 years ago, we started by cutting and burning forests for agriculture. So if we destroy those forests, they're no longer absorbing CO2. So, in, so we are effectively adding CO2 to the atmosphere. 5,000 years ago, the wetlands technique of growing ice began adding methane to the atmosphere. Methane is produced from the decomposition of organic matter in, in, the, in the wetlands. And so these agricultural practices uh, may have warmed the climate by as much as 0 0.8 degrees centigrade over thousands of years. And so they may have prevented actually some little ice ages and kept 
Earth's climate relatively stable in the past uh, uh, several thousands of years. So looking at greenhouse gases and aerosols in particular, uh, carbon dioxide causes over 50% of greenhouse warming caused by humans. We saw it was actually 60%. Carbon, uh, carbon dioxide is part of the carbon cycle, which is a major uh, building block of life on Earth. 20% of CO2 removed from the atmosphere is removed by photosynthesis. So at a plant's death, Oxidation, uh, which occurs whenever microbes eat it or we burn it, that returns the CO2 to the atmosphere. Um, and humans decompose plants faster at faster rates by burning them through burning wood and fossil fuels. And so CO2 increases in the atmosphere and the water as it dissolves into the water. And so you can see. Uh, in 1800, CO2 concentration in the atmosphere was 280 parts per million. In 2012, it was 396 parts per million. And CO2 removed from the atmosphere, 20% uh, is removed by photosynthesis, 30% dissolves into the ocean, but 50% stays in the atmosphere. So 50% of our emissions stays in the atmosphere. You can see this is the atmosphere concentration of carbon. You see, it's a steadily increase that's until this is up until 2010. Methane causes about 16% of greenhouse warming. It's 21 times uh, more powerful at trapping heat than CO2. It has risen more than 150% since 1750 to uh, 700 parts per billion. It's re released during the de decomposition of vegetation in oxygen poor environments, like such as mud volcanoes. But methane is actual is also natural gas. So whenever we uh, pump natural gas out of the earth and it leaks, that adds that adds methane to the atmosphere, which adds to the greenhouse warming. So seventy percent of methane is given off by human activities through uh, the burning of fossil fuels, growing rice, maintaining livestock, landfills, burning wood, and rotting animal waste and human sewage. That's all ways in which we produce methane. And so uh, the also methane can be produced um, where frozen deposits of methane in the deep parts of the ocean, the ocean warms enough, uh, those frozen methane deposits called methane hydrates can melt and methane bubbles out of the ocean and uh, accelerates the warming even more. So we have uh, nitric, nitrous oxides produced naturally by bacteria removing nitrogen from organic matter, especially in soil. It's also produced by humans in agricultural activities, such as producing chemical fertilizers and the combustion and burning of, of fuels and engines. And then there's ozone. There's ozone in the stratosphere, which absorbs UV radiation and shields life. And, uh, but there's also ozone that we produce. That's uh, the principal component of smog in urban atmospheres. Produces by produced by gases interacting with sunlight and irritates the eyes and lungs. And ozone has been shown to shorten lives in ur urban areas. And then there's the CFCs, which are produced solely by humans. They do not occur naturally. They use as coolants and refrigerants and air refrigerators and air conditioners, uh, foam insulation in buildings and solvents. They aid in, in the destruction of ozone in the stratosphere and they can remain in the atmosphere for up to a century. So the 20th century has seen increases in the amount of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. They are byproducts of industrial and domestic energy production, rice and livestock agriculture. And the 20th century has seen population growth. Its population has doubled twice. That has produced even more greenhouse gases and the energy intensive lifestyle of the industrialized world has increased the production of greenhouse gases even more. So in the 21st century, our current century, the IPCC, Intergovernmental Panel of Climate Change, uh, came to this consensus that the current warming of our, of our climate is unequivocal. So we are the, which means that the warming that we are experiencing right now has not been recorded 
has not been known to have occurred at this rate any time in Earth's past. Most of the increase in global temperatures since 1950 is very likely due to the emissions of human greenhouse gases. Atmospheric concentration of greenhouse gases such as carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide have increased remarkably, remarkably, um, sorry, markedly as a result of human activities since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution in 1750, and now far exceed the pre-industrial values of the last 650,000 years. The probability that global warming occurs that, that we are uh, now currently observing occurs strictly due to natural changes alone is less than 5%. And world temperatures, uh, world temperatures could rise between 1.1 and 6.4 degrees centigrade, or 2 to uh, 2 and 11.5 degrees Fahrenheit during the 21st century. There is a greater than 90% probability of more frequent warm spells, heat waves, and heavy rainfall. And there is a greater than 66% chance of probability of increased droughts, tropical cyclones, extreme high tides. And sea level will probably rise 18 to 59 centimeters or 7 to 23 inches. And past and future CO2 emissions will continue to contribute to warming and sea level rise for more than a thousand years. A lot of these things we are observing, um, just as the IPCC projected. And so the change in climate is not just the warming, it's the change in uh, precipitation patterns as well. Uh, times of abnormal dryness in a region is known as a drought. And so during droughts, without the usual rainfall, uh, vegetation begins to die. Food supplies shrink, and that results in famine. And so famine tends to drive people apart rather than bring them together. Uh, in the early stage of famine, food is available but inadequate. People lose up to 10% of their body weight. They're still alert and vigorous. During the advanced stages of a famine, body weight decreases by about 20%, and the body reduces activity levels and apathy begins to set in. Then there's the near death stage, 30% or more of the body weight is lost, and there's indifference to surrounding and others. And so the threat that climate changes the society is this food insecurity, because civil society is is the foundation of it is an, an adequate source of food and water, right? And if we don't have adequate source of food and water, then people become desperate to get those basic needs met. And that desperate, um, the resort to that desperation lead, often leads to violence and the breakdown of civil society. And so that's the big one, the biggest threats um, that climate change has to uh, civilization and also the displacement of all the people who live along the coast they become what are known as climate refugees and they have to go somewhere and we know um, the refugee crisis that Europe was experiencing during the instability uh, political instability in in parts of the Middle East and, and Africa during the last decade and how disruptive um, that uh, refugee crisis is. And so there was the, the refugee crisis would be on a global scale uh, as sea levels rise. So ice, ice melting and sea level rise. So glacial ice holds 2.15% uh, of water on Earth. If all the ice melted, sea level was, would rise 65 meters or 210 feet. So this will not happen in the foreseeable future. However, there are regions of concern. The Arctic sea ice has been shrinking every decade. Um, in 2009 was the 13th consecutive September with below average sea ice extent. And there reaches a tipping point, which I talked about before, where uh, enough ice melts that even if warming stopped, the remaining ice would melt because of the positive feedback loop. The Greenland Continental Glacier uh, is melting. It, has increased and a large scale catastrophic collapse of these ice sheets are possible. Once again, there's this tipping point where once so much ice melts, 
positive feedback loop causes the rest of the ice to melt. Uh, a sea level rise of four to six meters in the upcoming century would cause major problems worldwide for major cities and low-lying deltas. We already see this in cities such as Miami, where if there is a large storm um, and high tide, the, the ocean watch, washes up the sewer and the streets flood. So in, in, in Miami, they're already building the streets higher so that they are above sea level at high tide during a storm. So tipping points are, are, are uh, well, change is usually gradual, uh, but it's not always. There are these points at which a small change can suddenly produce a large effect, and those are known as tipping points. And so the history of change it may not be a good predictor of the future. So just because maybe things have been changing at a, well, it hasn't even been gradual. Uh, the warming hasn't been gradual with respect to uh, uh, historical precedent, but the rate of warming we have been experiencing doesn't mean that is the rate of warming we will continue to experience because um, we can reach one of these tipping points and the ice could begin to melt more rapidly. And as the ice melts more rapidly, there's more surface area exposed that can absorb more energy, more light, and so the temperature will increase even more rapidly. And so we can create these, these these accelerants, where the climate, the, the climate change and warming is accelerated even more. So there are these tipping points. So it's a non-linear process. So we can't use the past to predict future warming. And there's also lag times. So changes in the climate are occurring slowly with respect to our, our emissions. But the full effects will not be felt for decades. Because just like a greenhouse, the moment you build a greenhouse, you put the last piece of glass in, it's not warm inside. It takes time for the light to enter into the greenhouse, be absorbed by the surface, the surface to warm, release the heat, and the heat to accumulate and warm the inside of the greenhouse. So there's a lag time. And the IPCC estimates the oceans will continue to warm throughout the 20th century, about 0 0.6 degrees centigrade. And there are lag times in temperature changes and in the melting of the ice sheets. So even if what that means is even if we stop emitting carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases today, we would still see warming in the future because we haven't the the we haven't experienced the warming due to past emissions yet. So because of the lag time, we are still experiencing the warming of past emissions, and we are not experiencing the warming due to our current emissions yet. We will that will take time for those emissions to uh, contribute to the warming with this lag time. So this is a list of, of uh, signs of change in the climate. So the freeze-free periods are lengthening in mid and high latitudes. There's asymmetrical warming in many regions. Daily low temperatures are increasing at twice the rate of daily high temperatures. Uh, there's longer growing seasons in regions. Mosquito carrying diseases are migrating further north and south. We saw that with the Zika virus. Early arrival of spring climates in Europe and North America. So birds are breeding earlier. Early arrival of migrant birds, earlier appearance of butterflies, earlier spawning of amphibians, earlier spawning of flowering of plants. Uh, population shifts in latitude and altitude. Greenland is becoming green again as parts of as uh, plants sprout and grow. Europe and New Zealand, their tree line is climbing to higher altitudes in mountains. Alaska is having expansion in the shrub covered area. North Atlantic Ocean, offshore California uh, are increasing abundance of warm water species. We even see the species of fish in the Narragansett Bay has been changing as the water uh, warms in the bay. Europe and North America, uh, there are 39 species of butterfly extended their ranges northward up to 200 kilometers or 125 miles. Costa Rica's lowland birds extend their range to higher elevations. And in Britain, there's been 12 bird species extended their ranges northward, an average of 12 miles. And Canada, red foxes extended their range northward, while Arctic foxes, uh, their range has retreated northward. So we see all these signs of, of, of warming in the wildlife, right? And we see this also in the bleaching of corals, right? a very, very an alarmingly, alarmingly 
large percentage of the corals on the planet bleach every year. Some of them come back uh, when they're in the cooler part of the year, but uh, more and more of them are not coming back to remaining permanently bleached and dead and the loss of uh, coral reefs due to bleaching. The bleaching cause is caused by um, warmer than average uh, water temperature. The loss of these coral reefs is going to be devastating due to the complex and diverse ecosystems that they they provide. So many other species will go extinct as those coral reefs bleach and die. So that is a very big concern in the near future. And so then there's the ripple effect as different species start to go extinct that disrupts the ecosystem. And uh, that disruption of the ecosystem will lead to you know, more extinctions. And so we are currently in the sixth mass extinction in Earth's history. So the rate at which the species are going extinct today is comparable to that of other mass extinction events in Earth's history. So what can we do? What are mitigation options? Well, obviously we need to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So that'll require changing our energy usage technologies. So uh, there's been a lot of movement towards that, which is fortunate. And um, as we move, begin to transition from fossil fuels as a source of energy to renewable energy, such as wind and solar and hydrothermal and so forth. And so the more we can transition to renewable energy sources and not rely on uh, inter, uh, greenhouse gas producing fossil fuels, the better. There's the cap and trade where uh, emissions allowances are placed on companies and companies can then buy or sell those credits. Uh, so a company uh, is, has an economic incentive to produce less carbon because then it'll have credits left over and it can sell those credits for a profit. Where if a company emits more carbon dioxide, then it has credits, then it has to purchase credits from a company that underproduced. So it creates an economic, creates a marketplace for these carbon credits and it and an economic incentive for companies to produce less carbon. Um, and then there's drastic engineering, uh, increased erosion, which would cause CO2 to be absorbed, fertilize the oceans, increases uh, the growth of algae, would, would, would increase CO2 absorption, uh, air scrubbing, uh, which is trying to take the carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, cloud brightening, so that they would reflect more sunlight back to space. These efforts may create bigger problems than they solve. All right, so people, we don't really wanna to have to resort to these large scale efforts. Fast action strategies are reduce emissions of black carbon, tropospheric ozone, methane, and hydrofluorocarbons. So these are links to two videos. This talks about uh, ancient climate change on Earth, which is interesting because, you know, the more we understand about historic climate change on Earth, the more that can give us a perspective of our current climate change and how the rate of warming um, we are observing today is unprecedented. And it is not a very um, comforting thing to see how life responded to rapid changes in climate, even they're rapid, but not as rapid as we currently are experiencing. And, and those slower than, than, than now increases in Earth's temperature have, have resulted in mass extinctions, which is, which is troubling. And this is another video, like another video that talks about uh, historical mass extinctions on, Earth's, on Earth and how it has been linked to different climatic events. And thank you very much. And this concludes our lecture.